Um, just real quick, a little bit about me. Senior software engineer at Red Canary. Uh, I have an adorable cat that I did not bring with, unlike Winter, but would have if you wouldn't have freaked out. Uh, and who here knows what a Renaissance fair is? Okay, more than I thought. So this is mostly an American thing. They're not historically accurate. They're just like giant nerd fests in the summer and everyone wears costumes and I'm that kind of person who wears costumes. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, a note, I think in the description for this talk, I said I was gonna touch on APIs and specs. Unfortunately for time, I had to cut those sections, but come talk to me if you're interested and I'd love to chat about it. So first, why is this even a talk? Right? When we think about accessibility, typically we're thinking about the front end, the user interface. So why do as people who work on the back end, why do we even need to think about this at all? There's also internal users, which is kind of the big focus of this talk, especially since we're not addressing APIs. So a couple of statistics, 16% of people globally have some kind of disability. 20% of people have dyslexia. And 8% of men are colorblind. There's a lot of men here today. <laughs> Be very surprised if none of you were colorblind. And it's not just older people, right? I think sometimes we have this stereotype that, oh, as you know, people get older, their vision starts to go, or their mobility starts to get worse. But one in 12 adults under 35 have a disability. So this really is impacting this wide range of people. This means this is probably at least one of your coworkers who has one of these conditions. They'd benefit in ways big and small from our products and our processes being more accessible. And the best part is, these kinds of improvements benefit everyone. So let's take a look at a few examples. Who here uses an Alexa or something similar? Okay, I think the laughter means a lot of people. I don't actually, but. Uh, the first full text-to-speech synthesizer was invented in 1976 to help the blind community. How many people listen to audiobooks? Yeah, a lot of people raised your hands. The first audiobook was recorded in 1932 by the American Foundation for the Blind. How many people use an electric toothbrush? Yeah. This I thought was really interesting. These were invented in 1954 for people with mobility issues. So all of these are, are inventions or designs that were originally intended for specific populations that had some kind of disability. And now everyone uses them. And so the point here is even if something maybe has a neutral impact for you, so you're not using an Alexa, you use a regular toothbrush, adhering to these accessibility standards, thinking about what's gonna make people's lives easier across, across a wide spectrum is just really important and often does have unexpected benefits for everyone else. So what do we mean by accessibility, right? I think a lot of us probably think of color contrast or navigating by keyboard, but it really goes far beyond that. So this is from the US Centers for Disease Control. They define disability as any condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and interact with the world around them. So again, this is a fairly broad definition. So what kind of states or experiences might fall under this broader definition of disability? So long-term disabilities, these are ones I think we think of a lot. I think this is making noise. I'm just gonna take it off real quick. And I'm gonna be a one-earing lady for the rest of this talk. All right, that's better. So blindness, right, ADHD, paralysis, these are all sort of long-term disabilities. But there's a lot of temporary disabilities as well that could be even more likely to impact yourself or your coworkers. So you broke your arm, you had long COVID, you had whiplash, someone here was on a train for a long time and their neck really hurt, right? That could impede your ability to do your job in some ways. And then there are experiences or conditions right, thinking about that, that definition that we heard, that can also make your job more difficult. For example, do you have any coworkers who have a different first language than the rest of the team? Our early career programmers have a baby at home, right, not being enough sleep, not as much ability to concentrate or to focus, or use a different tech stack in their current role than they did at previous jobs, right? These are all conditions of the mind 
or the body, in the case of not getting enough sleep, that make it more difficult to do certain activities. And we want everyone on our team to feel supported and included and empowered to do their best. And really, a lot of that comes down to minimizing struggle wherever possible. We make our products accessible, but not the processes by which they are built. Our development practices themselves are inaccessible. This is from a talk by a software engineer at AWS who, over time, due to, I believe, a hereditary condition, started to lose vision. And so there are two main ways that we can approach accessibility from the back end, the code itself, and general practices. First, let's take a look at the code. If there's one thing you take away from this talk, avoid abbreviations and acronyms. Thank you, yes. <laughs> It's so easy to do. I catch myself doing it all the time. But when we avoid using these, this shorthand, we're decreasing the need for context or interpretation. We're preventing confusion and misunderstanding. And then this last one is an example I actually heard at my current job. Can you bug TSE to connect with the CSM about AWS and CB? And now I know what that means. But when I first started, I had no clue. And the more time it takes to evaluate each of those acronyms or abbreviations that you're hearing, the less you're able to focus on the rest of the content and you start to fall behind and it's just a big old mess. So let's just not do it. So first, the code. We're going to talk about readability, naming, and linters. So how do we approach readability in the code in a way that, that makes it more accessible? We all know naming is like one of the hardest things, right? A big thing that we're looking for is how do we find this balance between meaning and length? So the more verbose we are, right, the more characters we use, generally, the easier it is to understand. But the shorter it is, the easier it is to skim. And when we think about line length, which we're going to talk about, there's also issues of people with concentration issues being able to get all the way across and absorb that content all in one line without breaking it up into ways that are easier to digest. Pronounceable words. This is a big one that I didn't really think about until I started researching for this talk. If you're pairing with someone and you're reading code that has, you know, variable names with no vowels, how do you pronounce that out loud? So how do we make our code readable so that it's easier to reference when we're working with someone else? This is also better for screen readers because screen readers literally are reading the code out loud. Okay, let's take a look at some examples. So it's a little small. The main thing we care about is what we're naming our variables. So in the first example, we just have failed and old. So we said, if failed or old, do something. But what makes it fail? How do we know that it's too old? There's just not enough context here. The second one gives us more context than we need. Right? So these variables, instead of failed, we have has reached max fails before continuing. And then for old, we have has been running longer than acceptable. OK, well, it's very obvious what's going on, but that's a lot, of, it's a lot of characters. This is kind of one that hits in the middle. So reached max fails. Cool. And then instead of old, we have running too long. And so this gives us more context for what leads to these state de designations without literally spelling everything out for us. So let's look at some more with naming. So I really like this. Let the code be unambiguous and self-documenting. Using words for placeholders and loops and iterations. Who here has occasionally done like the X or the single letter as a place? Yeah, I see, I see, had not. Don't do that. <laughs> I know it's faster to type, but it's so much harder to read. Uh, the one I always think about is I was looking at a spec file. It was like a six or 700 line spec file, which we can talk about that. But it was nested under, or the, the let statement at the very top was let s equal subdomain. And I was only interested in one test around line 450. And all that test did was call s dot, s dot, if s then, and I had no idea what s was. So I had to scroll back up at the top, figure out where s was to find, huge waste of my time. So part of that PR for that code was switching that S to subdomain. It was so much easier to read. 
And then again, kind of like we talked about with you want your code to be pronounceable, choosing existing method approaches that read like sentences. So here's an example. This was the code that was in the code base that I came across. CB equals message dot G sub, new line character blank string. We can figure out what this is doing, right? This isn't complicated code, but I have to take a second to parse it. It's not as intuitive as this, right? We're moving our, our abbreviation, carbon black equals message dot delete new line. So these are probably doing similar things under the hood, but one is much quicker to read, to parse, reads much more like a sentence than the other one does. And so when we're reviewing code or writing new code, thinking about how we can write them in ways that, again, they feel more like a sentence versus programming. Linters. Linters are amazing when we're thinking about accessibility for a number of reasons. The main one, they keep your code consistent, but they also keep it predictable. So again, if someone is coming to your code base for the first time, maybe they aren't you know, familiar with Ruby, maybe they're earlier in their career, being able to look up the list of rules that your company has decided to follow and be able to enact those rules in their own code saves everyone time, makes everything more clear. It's just super great. So for example, Red Canary, we are huge into linters. We use a whole bunch of them. And then just some general best practices when we're thinking about accessibility within our code. So line length, there is a reason that the RuboCop default is 100 characters. We read best between about 75 to 100 characters. And so I always think about if you look at the New York Times website, for example, which is text that is solely meant to be read online, and their line length doesn't go above like 79 characters. So. We want to keep those shorter lines. They're not only better for screen readers, but also people who have dyslexia. So making it so that we're not stretching all the way across the screen or forbid having to like scroll in your editor, you can see everything at a glance. It makes it easier to skim and find the parts that you're interested in and kind of absorb in the aggregate what the code is trying to do in that particular place. Indentation. This is a balance between kind of, you know, linter recommendations, which sometimes want you to do super funky things, and what actually works for people. And you might be thinking, okay, why, why are we talking about screen readers? Why are we talking about blindness? You know, how many programmers are there who are blind? First thing to remember is that blindness is a spectrum. So some people might only be able to see on the outside. Some people have pinhole in the front. Some people, it's just a little fuzzy. Some people, it changes day to day. And according to Stack Overflow's 2023 developer survey, almost one in 50 developers are blind or have vision issues. And there's also people who lose vision over time. So one of my coworkers is older, and whenever we pair, I know to magnify my screen, if I'm screen sharing, to make it easier for him to engage with the content that we're looking at. So here's some more examples. So this, actually both of these, I believe, pass RuboCop's like indentation linting. This is fine. This one is better. It's getting rid of some of that additional white space that we just don't need. It's putting our arguments all closer together. And some of you might be thinking, like, I just really hate how that looks. Like, that hurts my heart. I see a couple of people laughing. Yeah. Yeah, and I get that. I think the thing to remember is that while preference is personal, accessibility is global. And so the analogy I like to use is if you're going into an office and you have the most uncomfortable chair, it's really hard, it has these little like spikes on the armrest, it's like at a perfect angle, there's no cushioning, it's just the worst chair, no wheels, so you have to pick it up whenever you want to move. Terrible chair. But you have to use it because your office manager thinks they look really cool. It's fairly similar, right? So thinking about how do we minimize struggle, not how do we build aesthetic. So then moving on to documentation. This is another huge part of our jobs, or at least hopefully it is. And there are a lot of things we can do with documentation to make it more accessible for our coworkers. Uh, one of the things I don't list in here, but that I like to bring up is document, you could write the best piece of documentation, and if it isn't updated, it becomes useless. 
And so one of the things that I like to do to kind of help mitigate this is I have a repeating monthly calendar event just for like half an hour, and I go through the list of, of all of the documentation that I've contributed to, and I just take a quick look. And I think, have I done anything in this area in the last month? Most of the times the answer is no. But sometimes the answer is, oh, we just actually redid a section of this. I'm going to go in and update it quick. Or, you know, we added a new page that would be great to add as a resource linked to on this pre-existing page. So how do we think about traditional accessibility considerations regarding documentation? Don't use images of code. <laughs> I'm sure we've all done this. I know I've done this in the past, but nothing is more frustrating than when you're following a run book, go to copy a script, and it's an image of the script. <laughs> so don't do it. Use the actual text. Now, one person, I gave this talk, and they said, well, what if I want to keep the, you know, like, what if the, the program we're using for our documentation doesn't do good code formatting? And I want, you know, and the, and the colors that are in the, the screenshot are really helpful. Okay, great, put both, right? Put the image, and then below, put it as text. Using semantic HTML. So you can do this even if it's a, a WYSIWYG editor, right? Those are just using HTML under the hood. And so thinking about starting with our H1s, working our way down to, you know, H4, H5, whatever, using actual tables for tables, using lists. Lists are fantastic. They make it super easy to scan. I mean, all of these, all of these things with, with semantic HTML, it's not just helpful for screen readers or for people who might have concentration issues, but it makes it a lot easier for everyone to skim through and find what you're looking for. So instead of having to read giant blocks of text, if you're like, okay, I've done, seen this issue before, like all I really care about is that script, which is now in text, I can scroll down, find the script subheader, boom, I'm right there, I can carry on my way. Uh, that also helps when, if you have a program that does auto-generated tables of contents because it's gonna pull directly from those headers. And then related to not using images of your code, having captions or transcripts for video documentation. And this can be a big lift, this is something we haven't traditionally Focus a lot on it, Red Canary, as an example, but we discovered after playing around, one of my colleagues and I, that we could have a Zoom with just, you know, like just me, and I could play the video and have Zoom do the transcript, and it's actually pretty accurate. So just kind of run that in the background, let it do the transcript, and then add it to where we link or embed the, the uh, video. And then keeping it simple. This is something I wasn't really familiar with until I started researching this talk. But you know, we've talked a lot about like dyslexia or concentration or focus issues. And that same stack overflow survey of developers found that one in 10, so 10% 10 of programmers have a concentration or memory disorder. And those are people who have it kind of consistently, right? Think about, you know, again, those temporary disabilities we talked about, like you have a new baby at home or, um, you know, maybe something else stressful is going on that's taking away some of your focus, or you didn't sleep well the night before, or maybe you're on call and you get pinged on a Saturday. All of these diminish our ability to consume large blocks of text or complicated writing. Or again, if the documentation is in a language that isn't your first language. And so how do we, how do we mitigate this? So, Again, simple writing helps with a wide variety of people. Cognitive considerations, primary language. I think I said all these. I should have paid attention to my slide. Anyway, yeah, so just to reiterate, it helps a lot of people. So how do we do this? Avoiding ampersands. This is such a small thing, but apparently screen readers are not huge fans of ampersands. Keeping your sentences short, right? So this is very similar to the line length we talked about with our code. 15 to 20 words tends to be pretty safe for sentences. They found that when the average sentence length is 14 words, readers understand more than 90% of what they're reading. So they're still missing about 10%, even with that short of a sentence. Longer sentences, on the other hand, if we go up to, let's say, 43 words per sentence, comprehension drops to less than 10%. So there's this super clear delineation between short sentences, short lines of code, and increased comprehension. And then you can test the reading level of your text, or 
get AI suggestions for simplifying it. So the best one that I've seen is Hemingway, but again, this one is only for English, unfortunately. But it does really cool analysis of your text and tells you where you can make improvements for readability. There are a couple of others that work for additional languages. So language tool does up to 30 languages, but most of the cool bells and whistles are behind a paywall. And then paraphrase tool is another one that claims to have 100 plus languages and dialects, and there is a free tier for that one. And so it'll, it'll essentially generate paraphrases of the text you put in, and you can look for ones that, that simplify it, make it shorter, use less complicated words, things like that. Some additional tips and tricks for accessible documentation. Link text should be informative, not click here. I'm real bad about this one. Uh, part of this is, again, for screen readers, but part of this is also so that you know exactly where that link is going to take you. When you click it, you know exactly what's going to happen. So instead of saying, click here for more, you could just have the link be, you know, RSpec documentation or, you know, a GitHub markdown cheat sheet or something, right? Linking to the exact place that we're going. Write dates and times in unambiguous ways. So I feel like this is probably preaching to the choir a little bit. But like, how do you write May 10th? Yeah. And I still see this, people who use like the slash notation. It's like, just write it out. Avoid the confusion. A lot of this is really just how do we avoid confusion? How do we prevent it? And then this is one, avoiding using socially charged terms for technical concepts. And so I've got a list here. These, these are ones that I know are socially charged in American English. I can't speak for you know, other languages, but as some examples, right, switching to allow list instead of whitelist. Main instead of master. Core feature instead of native feature. So really just thinking about the language we're using and how it could create unexpected challenges for people who are engaging with it. And then overall communication. So again, be careful of assuming cultural context, watching for gender assumptions or exclusion. And we had a really interesting conversation last night at the speaker's dinner about like English is not a gendered language and others are, and just how that all plays out in some of these scenarios. So doing your best to not inadvertently exclude folks based on gender. This is a, such a small one that can make a really big impact, adding your pronouns and name pronunciation to your profile. Who here has done that at their company? Not enough. <laughs> it's such a small thing, and I think the thing to remember is even if in your culture or your language or whatever, your name is super common and how to pronounce it, you think everyone knows, I can guarantee there are people who don't. And then avoiding phrases like, it should be easy. Maybe it should be easy. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Especially, again, if you're talking to someone who has a disability or who is tired or who just hasn't worked on this kind of problem before. So instead, I like to say things like, I expect it'll be straightforward but let me know if you run into any snags. So giving people space for something to be harder than you anticipate. And then real quick, we're gonna talk about a couple of engineering policies. And so this is looking beyond the obvious ones, like a you know, a building that has ramps for wheelchairs or gender neutral paid family leave, right? And this is looking specifically at like, what are some engineering policies we can employ to increase accessibility in our workplaces? So flexible work schedules, Choosing vendors and tools that prioritize accessibility. So this is a big one. If you're doing everything right on your team or at your company to have an accessible workplace for, you know, let's say a programmer with low vision, but the vendors you work with aren't doing anything, then they're still going to be struggling a lot. And then offering folks a variety of tools to get the job done. This is another one that I didn't think of as an accessibility issue until I started looking into this talk. And so here's a bit about that. Tools like canines can make using Kubernetes more accessible for individuals with dyslexia or colorblindness than using kubectl. Allowing developers to customize their setup to their preferences is a crucial aspect of enhancing accessibility. So if we don't have a strong business case 
for requiring everyone to use the same IDE or to have their setup the same way, giving people flexibility to choose what works for them can really go a long way. And this talk was about the back end, but again, if your front end isn't accessible, like most of us have to at least look at the front end sometimes, whether we're interacting with the UI. And so if you have an inaccessible front end, then that's still gonna cause issues even for back end engineers. So some key takeaways. Most of the work for accessibility comes from small individual efforts. It's not some big game changer. Changes to make products or processes easier benefits everybody. And even if you rarely touch the UI or the front end or interact with users, you can still have a big impact on accessibility within your workplace. And avoid abbreviations, <laughs> please. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs>